Well, happy Sabbath, everybody. Are you having a happy Sabbath so far? Do you enjoy the happy Sabbath greeting? Is that like music to your ears when somebody says, happy Sabbath? Do you like it? It doesn't work on Sunday. Do you, do you like hearing that, happy Sabbath? I found over the years that when you say the same thing over and over again, you can go into intellectual neutral and forget what it means. Have you noticed that? So I like to change up my Sabbath greeting occasionally to remind myself what it means. So not too long ago, I came up with a new Sabbath greeting, and I walked into a local Seventh-day Adventist church where I, I would be preaching, and I, I encountered the elder right there. He looked, he had that elderish look. You know how those elders look? And there he was, all elderish looking. I walked into the foyer, and there he was, and uh, I said, happy salvation, happy salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone day. I'll come back to the elder in a minute, but you try that Sabbath greeting on one another right now. Just turn to the person next to you. Happy salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone day. Go. <laughs> Good job, almost. All right. Well, that, that, that's what the Sabbath means. The Sabbath... The Sabbath isn't just about physical rest. It's about the spiritual and emotional and psychological and social rest of reposing in the salvation that Jesus has already accomplished for us, right? So that we don't need to be continually filled with pagan anxiety as to whether or not we're going to make it. We've already made it in Christ. So happy salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone day. Well... This elder didn't like the greeting. He just looked at me as though he had heard some kind of heresy. And he said, happy, you better keep the Ten Commandments before Jesus comes day. <laughs> to which I responded, happy, if we love him, we will keep his commandments day. <laughs> to which he responded, Happy the investigative judgment is underway and you had better get your act together, Day. <laughs> to which I responded, Happy I've read Daniel 7 and 8, and apparently you haven't, and judgment is in favor of the saints of the Most High God, Day. <laughs> and that was it. The gospel won with the elder in the church foyer that Sabbath day. Let's pray briefly. Father in heaven, Please intervene on our behalf right now. We want to hear from you in Jesus' name. Amen. My absolute favorite place in all the world when I was a little boy was my grandmother's house. Uh, my grandmother was an incredible woman, loved her with all my heart. On this particular occasion, uh, my two younger brothers, my younger sister, myself, and a lot of our cousins were, were at my grandmother's house for the summer. And it was just incredible. She was the kind of person, the kind of woman that you just wanted to be around. She was so attractive. On every level, this woman would just draw in her grandchildren and we just circled around her just waiting for what was next. She was full of adventure. She was a real grandma, by the way a real grandma, not like some of these young, hot grandmas you see nowadays. She was the real deal. She was pretty tall, big boned. She made all of her own clothing on a treadle sewing machine. No electricity. She had electricity, but she liked this treadle sewing machine. She made all of her dresses from one pattern, but different kinds of fabrics. Uh, so they all looked exactly the same, except for you know different colors, stripes, flowers, whatever. She had long gray grandma hair that she twisted up into a bun on top of her head and she put two sticks through it. She looked the part. This was a real grandma. She had her teeth in a jar by the bed. <laughs> and occasionally, and we loved it, although it was pretty creepy, grandma would lean down to us children and she would let her teeth drop from her gums and clank around in her mouth like a horror movie. And then she would laugh as we would scream and run away, and then we'd come back and want her to do it again. It was just so incredible. 
My grandma had a loaded shotgun by the front door. She said it was in case any political liberals came around. <laughs> My grandmother did not have a washing machine. She had a rather large bathtub, and she would take all of our clothing as grandkids and put them in the bathtub, fill it up with water, put some detergent in there, and she would put us kids on shifts marching back and forth on the clothing. <laughs> and then we would wring them out as best we could, and she would hang them in the backyard. It was, it was just incredible. I remember going into the backyard, and she didn't have a dryer, so she had a line, and the clothing would hang on the line and dry. And I remember as a little boy, just eight years old, standing there in the backyard on this occasion during the summer after the clothing had been washed and hung on the line, I remember looking up at the line. And right there, I saw my little boy undies. They were about this big. And right next to them, my grandma's underwear. <laughs> and I remember as a little boy just realizing that my grandmother was bigger than me. And I had so much respect for her. I loved this woman. Now, the best thing about my grandmother was what she called cakes on the griddle. Pancakes. What do you call them here? Pancakes? OK, so she, would, she had this big iron griddle. And we would wake up every morning to the aroma of pancakes cooking on this griddle. And we children would jump up, run to the kitchen, line up, and you could place any order you wanted. She had multiple bowls with batter, pancake batter, all different colors. That's before we knew that that food coloring causes cancer, but she was using it. And it was all these different colors. And she had different sized ladles, and uh, you could order anything. I want a dolphin, which was my favorite. Uh, I, I want an elephant. I want a platypus, whatever. And she would go to work doing pancake artistry on the griddle and make the approximate shape of the thing that you had ordered. It was just incredible. On this one particular morning, as we woke up to that beautiful aroma, and we lined up in the kitchen, and we placed our orders, while we're waiting, we were playing our favorite game, hide and seek. And as we were playing hide and seek, I ended up as a little boy in a very terrible predicament because all the hiding places were taken. There was nowhere I went to look where there wasn't some other cousin or brother or sister. And so I stood there in the kitchen with my, with my bottom lip kind of quivering. I'm about to cry. And she's standing there at the stove making pancakes and and my older cousin is counting up to, I don't know, 100 or something, 95, 96. And I'm just standing there. I'm going to get caught. I have no place to hide. And my grandmother just stands there. And she rather casually says, Ty, do you want the best hiding place on earth? And I said, yes, Grandma, please. Best hiding place. Yes. Where can I hide? She said, Ty, I will give you the best hiding place on earth. But I'm telling you. I am commanding you, when you get there, whatever you do, do not look up. <laughs> I said, Grandma, I will not look up. And she lifted her long dress up to reveal her bony white grandma knees, and she motioned with the spatula, and it dawned on me, she wants me to go under there. And I thought, she's right. That is the best. And I slid to home base. <laughs> she dropped her dress around me and just stood there, casually, cooking pancakes. All the children had been found. And they were all saying, where's Ty? Where's Ty? Nobody knows where Ty is. My grandma just stood there as I was in the best hiding place on the earth, not looking up. She stood there making cakes on the griddle. She said, maybe he's outside. And I heard the screen doors for the back door and the front door open and slam shut, and they were all gone, and it was silent. She lifted her dress. I came out. She said, told you, best hiding place on earth. <laughs> now, the thing you need to understand is 
that that aroma of those pancakes is forever embedded in my memory because there was a very specific reason why at least my family was there at grandmother's house that particular summer. While we were playing hide and seek and eating cakes on the griddle, my mother, just 27 years of age, was lying on one of the beds in one of the bedrooms in my grandmother's house. She had a fractured skull, broken ribs, multiple facial wounds because she had received her last beating in an abusive marriage that we had just escaped from. We drove all through the night as she bled. She was hospitalized, she was released, she was put there at her mother's house, my grandmother's house, and while she was healing, my grandmother's house for us children that summer was not just a fun place to hang out with grandma, it was a refuge from the horrors of a life that I had only ever known. There was never anything else than all of that. And then there was grandmother by contrast to all of that. So that aroma, wherever I go in the world, it doesn't matter where I go, if I smell pancakes, immediately I think of her. That's how the human mind works. You know how memory works. All of our memories are embedded with sensory stimuli. Have you ever heard a song and you're taken back to a place years ago? Maybe you're on a beach and you can just almost relive the moment when he proposed because that song brings it all up. Have you ever been in a situation where you hear a particular sound or you see something and it triggers a memory for you? Well, I want to share with you this morning that the Lord Jesus Christ was given a very special gift by one of his followers who was thinking very carefully. And this particular follower of Jesus went way, way around the cultural norms of the time in order to communicate with Jesus in a way that literally nobody else ever did during his time on this earth. Now we're going to pick up the story in Matthew chapter 26. Matthew's the storyteller on this occasion, and he is using what we might call a looping technique. So he's telling a story that has more than one line, more than one loop, more than one narrative, but the narratives are all intersecting. So he begins with the disciples, and here Matthew says that what was happening is that Jesus was with his disciples, and they're walking along on some kind of journey, of course. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings in the previous chapter, he had been teaching, he had been talking, and he had been explaining to them some of the mysteries of his kingdom. And so when he had finished all these sayings, now he's not with the crowd, the press of the crowd. It's just him and his disciples, and they're departing from the group he had been teaching. And, and he and the disciples, they're just, they're just walking along, and they're headed somewhere. There's a destination. We don't know in verse 1 what the destination is, but Matthew's about to divulge to us that there is a place that they are going. So Jesus now is alone with his disciples, pictured in your mind. They're just walking along some dusty path headed somewhere. And Jesus breaks in to their conversation as they're walking along, and he says something. He says something startling. He says, you know that after two days is the Passover. And of course, at that point, they would have been nodding. Yeah, yeah, we know. The Passover's coming up. After two days will be the Passover, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Now, there's a fascinating thing that follows in the next verse, and that is that the disciples are completely silent on the matter. He just said, I'm going to be crucified, and they say nothing. Because if you pan out in the story in the Gospels, you discover that all of them are oblivious. All of them are expecting that Jesus at some point is going to become the military Messiah that their imaginations had been longing for their whole lives growing up. They want a Messiah 
who will rise to the pinnacle of power and will exalt Israel with him over the Romans. They want coercion. They want force. They want violence. This is what's pulsating in their hearts. So when their Messiah says, I'm going to be crucified, you have to understand that this is not something that they can even wrap their minds around. This is, this is like the ultimate cognitive dissonance for them. What, what are you talking about? Stop talking like that. In fact, at one point in the story, Jesus had foretold his crucifixion, and, and Peter said, no, it's not going to happen. And, and Jesus said, well, that's the devil talking through you, trying to deter me from the course that I'm on. Get behind me, Satan. Jesus addressed the devil through Peter. So none of them believe it's going to happen. None of them want it to happen. They don't know what to do with this kind of talk from their Messiah. I'm going to be crucified. Worse yet, crucifixion was known by all of the disciples and everybody of that time to be the execution technique for political insurrectionists. So to say, I'm going to be crucified, is to say to them, actually, the Roman Empire's going to win. I'm not going to rise over them by force. They're actually going to crucify me for political crimes. Well, that's another part of the story that we don't have time to fill out. But suffice it to say that Jesus is embarking upon a political campaign. He is launching a political kingdom that he has already given his political manifesto concerning in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus has told them over and over again, I am a nonviolent Messiah who will conquer at the heart level of human beings by nonviolence. He said it over and over again, and it's gone straight through them, over their heads. They don't get it, they don't believe it, and they constantly push back on it. They are silent when he says, I'm going to be crucified. I want you to also notice that he says that this crucifixion event is going to happen from the point at which they're talking in just how long? Two days. Now, that's important. Put that in your pocket. We're coming back to it. He's going to be crucified in just two days. Now, the next verse, then the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders of the people assembled at the palace of the high priest, who is called Caiaphas. Now, what Matthew has done you and I, as the readers of the story, we're with Jesus and the disciples, and they're walking along. They have some destination. They're going somewhere. And then Matthew says, hey, but while Jesus is with his disciples, come over here and see another part of the story. And he loops over to the religious leaders, and he says that over here across town, somewhere else, something else is going on. And we need to know this part of the story for where it goes. They were plotting to take Jesus by trickery and kill him. He just told the disciples, I'm going to be crucified. Well, the plot is being laid in order to crucify him by the religious leaders of the time. But the religious leaders said, but hey, let's not crucify him during the feast. That is, during the feast of the Passover, lest there be an uproar among the people. So these are extremely religious individuals. And they are reasoning in their minds that they do not want to be caught crucifying Christ during their religious festival. May I suggest to you that over and over again down through history that religion is the best place in the world to hide from God. If you really want to take cover from the deep things of God, which will act as a mirror to show you yourself so that things need to be worked out in relation to others. If you want to take cover from the Lord, the best place to do it is in church. Ellen White, those of you who are familiar with her, she will go so far in the book Desire of Ages, Desire of Ages to say this. She says that the religion of the Pharisees was a way of forgetting God that passed from remembering him. A way of forgetting God that passed for remembering him. In other words, we're God's people. We're faithful to God. We're it. We're it. We're it. Simultaneously, they are plotting the murder of a man 
that in their heart of hearts, they know by the Spirit's witness is in fact the Messiah that they have been waiting for. But he is a threat to their entire political edifice. They are in league with the Romans and they hold their positions by purchase in a political system. And Jesus is rising in popularity and he is promoting a set of principles that run directly contrary to everything that keeps them in power. So their religion had become a hiding place from the Lord God himself. Well, then we come to verse 6, and when Jesus was in Bethany, pause right there, now we know because the storyteller Matthew has looped back to Jesus. We were with Jesus and his disciples. They're journeying along. He says, I'm going to be crucified. Matthew says, come on over here because the plot is thickening. It's happening with the religious leaders. And now Matthew says, well, Jesus has now arrived with his disciples where he was going. Verse 6, he was in Bethany. Now, Bethany was a familiar town for Jesus. He had visited this town a number of times. We don't know exactly how frequently, but this was a favorite place of his because he, has fr he had friends there. His friends were Martha and Mary and Lazarus, three siblings, and their home was a kind of place where Jesus could go to just kick it with his disciples, answer theological questions from Mary, and eat great baba ganoush and hummus, that was being delivered by Martha out of the kitchen. So Jesus would take refuge in this place. He would, just, he would just hang out at their home. These were his friends. This wasn't the general press of the crowd. This is where Jesus could kind of come apart and rest a while in a hospitable home. But on this occasion, he wasn't there in Bethany to visit this familiar home. He came there to the house of Simon the leper. Now, you have to know something about Simon. Simon was a Pharisee. He was one of the religious elite. And Simon had leprosy. Now, in that culture, to have had leprosy communicated to everybody that, whoa, you must have done something pretty bad for God to do that to you. Because leprosy was equivalent to a guilt for some kind of secret sin that you just weren't coming forward and confessing. So there was a stigma around the Pharisee, Simon the leper. You know, what had he done? There's whispering. There's history. People know it's a small town. People know that there were rumors about something that Simon had done years ago, something having to do maybe with that, that family and those girls. So people knew that he was probably guilty of something, something pretty dark, something pretty dastardly. And leprosy was evidence that he was guilty. Well, Jesus healed him. Just healed him of leprosy, which was not only the removal of the disease, but the removal of the stigma, the reputation in the community. And why was Jesus now at the home of Simon the leper? Well, because if you have leprosy and you get healed, you throw a party. And that's what Simon was doing. He said, let's have a party, and I'm going to invite Jesus as the honored guest. We know from a harmony of the Gospels that also Lazarus was invited as a secondary honored guest, so to speak, because he had recently been raised from the dead by this same Jesus that healed Simon of leprosy. And I mean, if you have leprosy and you're healed and you're going to party... If you're dead and you're alive again, you're going to really party. And so what's happening here is there is this big feast that's going on in the honor of Jesus. And Jesus arrives with his posse into town. And they come in to Simon's house. And here they are. And the party's about to happen. And you know what parties are like, don't you? I mean, you don't. You're an Adventist. You've never been to one. But, but for those of you who know what parties are like, and those of you who've never been to one, I just want you to imagine what a party's like. In a party, is there noise, yes or no? Lots of noise. Hey, pass the pita bread down here. Little more olive oil, right? There's people talking. There are people, I haven't seen you in a while. Where have you been? What's going on in your life? People are chattering around the edges of the party. Is there music at a party? I mean, if it's a good party. 
Yeah, there's music at this. So there's music, there's chatter, there's food, there's all kinds of laughter. And so just feel it. Feel the party. And as Jesus is sitting there as the honored guest at the table, actually lounging there at the table as the honored guest, with all the noise of the party, this is what happens next. And a woman came to him having an alabaster flask of very costly fragrant oil, and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. Those of you who have a good imagination, what just happened in the party? What just happened? Silence, thank you. Everybody's like, ah, oh, 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 good to see you. Ah, oh, man, this Baba Ganesha is crazy. And then what? This woman walks into the house. Well, apparently she wasn't invited. Maybe her sister was the caterer for the event. We don't know. But she just walks in to this room full of people, and it's not a big town. This is not Sydney. This is not Auckland. This is not Los Angeles. This is Bethany. Everybody knows everybody. And she walks in, and immediately there's silence, and all eyes are on the woman as she crosses the room and makes her way to Jesus. And she has some very costly, fragrant oil, and she begins to pour it on his head. It's trickling down through his hair, into his beard, onto his clothing. As we'll read in a moment, Luke's gospel says that he also was anointed by this oil, by this woman on his feet. He is covered with this stuff from head to toe. And there's silence in the room. Why is there silence in the room? Well, because she has a reputation. She has a history. And everybody knows. But when the disciples saw what she was doing, they immediately began to reason within the parameters of just the financial considerations. When they saw it, they were, were indignant. And they began to whisper among themselves, why this waste, what they perceive as waste, watch this, for this fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. We don't know the motive of, of each one of these disciples who are coming up with this line of reasoning. We do know that one of them is a thief, and he happens to be the treasurer of the conference. And this particular guy, on this occasion, is the instigator of this line of reasoning. And the poor is not a consideration at all. What the consideration is, is that if enough money is in the coffers, some of it can be skimmed, and nobody will know the difference. Again, religion is often a cover for a whole lot of dastardly stuff. And so Jesus sees straight through this, but when Jesus was aware of it, he said to them, notice what Jesus does. He doesn't begin to argue with them about the financial part. He's not separating the woman from the event. He says, why do you trouble the woman? He is protective of her and her deed and what she's doing. He creates a kind of protective parameter around her so that she can act out her faith freely. Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a good work for me. What they see as waste, he interprets as a good work. He goes on and says, for you will have the poor with you always, but me you will not have always. And this is the point you need to slow down in the story. Jesus now interprets her act. For in pouring this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. You guys, the disciples don't believe he's going to be crucified. They're pushing back on his prophecy. He said it over and over again. There's literally just one person in the gospel story who actually believes Jesus is going to be crucified. And it's this woman. Everybody else has gone straight over their head. It's gone straight through them. Theologically, they can't make sense of it. They're thinking violent military messiah. And she's thinking, he loves me. 
They're thinking we need a hero that will flex some muscle and conquer the Romans. And she's thinking, he loves me. She's understanding the gospel on a level that nobody in the narrative understands. And so Jesus literally says that this woman is doing something that is rather common in that culture, except the timing is way off. Because in that culture, when a person died, when they died, post-mortem, the family, the friends, would bring fragrant oils and herbs and spices, and they would put it on and around the body to mask the odor and the decay of death. Never had it ever been done like this. She was anointing him for the burial. Jesus says that she knows what's going down, and she's breaking ranks from the cultural tradition, and somewhere along the way, she gets this ingenious idea. She says, hey, 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 I bought this for after he dies, but I've got a great idea. I'm going to put this on his body before he dies so he knows that I love him because of his love for me. The book Desire of Ages by Ellen White says it this way, the fragrant gift which Mary, now we know who she was, had thought to lavish upon the what? Say it out loud. The dead, say it out loud. The dead body of the Savior. What was her original plan? I'm just going to follow the common cultural norm. After he dies, I'm going to pay my respects by dousing his body with this fragrant oil. And check this out. She had thought to lavish this oil upon his dead body, but now she poured it upon his living form. What is she thinking? Well, here's what she's thinking. At the burial, its sweetness could only have pervaded the tomb. Now, it gladdened his heart with the assurance of her faith and love. She was communicating to him in this lavish act of giving him a kind of constant whisper with every breath he would take straight up to his death, she alone would be speaking to him. Every inhalation, Mary gets it. She loves me. She understands. The statement goes on and says, Mary pouring out her love, while the fragrant oil was apparently just emblematic of what was going on in her heart, pouring out her love on the Savior while he was conscious of her devotion, was anointing him for the burial. And as he went down into the darkness of his great trial, he carried with him the memory of that deed and earnest of the love that would be his from his redeemed ones that would include you and me forever. Do you see what she's doing? Do you see what she's doing? This is, in my opinion, the most ingenious Holy Spirit-inspired act in the entire biblical narrative. She alone believes the gospel at this point. She alone understands that his death is about to take place. She alone follows through to communicate with him. And then Jesus, knowing this, says, Assuredly, I say to you, to the disciples now, and to everybody who's listening, Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in all the world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. What? Jesus says, Hey, as I launch this movement, what I want to happen is that I want her story to be told over and over and over. Wherever you preach the gospel, tell her story. you got to tell her story, Jesus says. Why? Because Mary is a kind of, <clears throat> this is my language, I think it's accurate, you, you can dispute it, but it, it's, it's kind of like Mary is a prophetic prototype of the experience that the gospel produces in all who receive it. So in other words, what we see taking place in this woman, 
Jesus points to it and he says, that's it. That's it. That's, that's what I'm aiming for. Peter, not so much. John and James, eh. Thomas, get over it. Judas, so sad. Mary, he says to everybody, she's it. She's the revelation of the effect that the gospel is meant to have. Well, when we come to Luke's gospel, we now listen in on the conversation that Matthew doesn't give us. Because while in Matthew's account, the disciples are grumbling about the money, in Luke's account, Simon is moving through his own mental process as the woman walks into the room, into his house, kind of, you know, crashing his party, where Jesus is the center of attention so that Simon can be the center of attention. And so in Luke's gospel, we have an unfolding of events with this Pharisee, Simon. What had happened is that Mary came in, she anointed his head, his body, and was now, with the oil on his feet, kissing his feet and taking up the excess in her hair. What? Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, when he saw this, Simon spoke to himself, I don't know, in his mind or under his breath, saying, this man, this Jesus guy who I'm honoring, who healed me of leprosy, this man, if he were a prophet, because, you know, prophets know things. If he were really a prophet, well, he would know, note the language, what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. Which begs the question immediately, yo, Simon, how exactly do you know what manner of woman she is? And that's where there's a part of the story that you're just left to wonder if in this small town Bethany where Simon had been a big time religious leader, if he had not been the one, well then you read the book Desire of Ages if you like that book and you discover that in fact he had sexually violated her and he is the very one who set her on the path to spiral downward in her self-respect in shame to spiral downward to think that she was worth nothing more than what men could do to her body. And now he has the audacity, having been healed of leprosy, to be utterly blind to his part in the entire story and even his part apart from her story. When he saw this, all he could see, listen, was what manner of woman she was. But he couldn't see the woman. He couldn't see the girl. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he, that Simon, said, teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other only 50. This is a big amount, large amount of money, small amount of money. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he, that is the person who had loaned the money, freely forgave them both. This is a snapshot of the character of God, of the heart of God. Forgiveness is not something we twist God's arm into with our good deeds, with our, even our repentance. In fact, Paul's gospel says it's the goodness of God in forgiveness that leads us to repentance. His goodness precedes any movement in us toward him. So this creditor freely forgave them both, and then Jesus poses the rather probing question, tell me therefore which of them will love him more? Notice how Simon responds. He answered and said, I suppose. Now I just want to pause right there. I suppose. Really, Simon? You suppose. Were you tracking with the story? Did you hear what was said? Are you in touch with your own guilt and the fact that you were just healed of leprosy? Apparently not. I suppose the one whom he forgave more? And Jesus, I'm going to add here, rather graciously, 
said, you have rightly judged with your, you know, very, very incremental, slight concession to the grace of God. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, now picture it, this is such an amazing scene. He turned to the woman. Jesus is here acting the part of the advocate for the oppressed. Jesus is now no longer merely in conversation with Simon, the religious leader. Now Jesus turns to the woman. He wants her to feel his acceptance over against the rejection she's feeling from this religious leader. Then he turned to the woman and said, Simon, do you see this woman? <clears throat> and the fact is, he didn't see the woman. He saw the body. He saw the form. He saw the history. He saw the guilt. He saw the sin. He saw what manner of woman she is. No, Simon did not see the woman. I'd like to introduce you to boundary thinking versus center thinking. Now, in our illustration, <clears throat> I want you to track with me. This is going to take, you know, a little bit. You're going to have to really pull yourself up intellectually to remember all the points here because there's A, Bs, and Cs, and X, Ys, and Zs, and you know how that goes. Okay. So in boundary thinking, you have A, B, and C. We'll call them Alistair, Charlene, and Bob. And then, outside of the parameters, you have X, Y, and Z, Xavier, Yolanda, and Zane. And from all appearances, from the human perspective, it looks like, well, Alistair and Cheryl or Charlene, what's her name? I don't know. And Bob, it, it looks like they're in and who's out? Well, who's out is Xavier, Yolanda, and Zane. They're out. We're in, they're out. Oh, that feels good. It's euphoric. It's self-medicating. But that's boundary thinking. Now, if we have a point of reference, if we have a center, if we put a center into the picture, suddenly, upon further analysis, we can see that actually Zane, who's out, is closer to center than Alistair, who's in. Are you tracking still? All right? And let's just call center Jesus. And let's call the parameters of the black box the church. And now that we've added center and our entire perception of what constitutes in and out is slightly upset, you should be uncomfortable right now. Go ahead, feel it. Be uncomfortable. Well, let's just add one more feature. Let's add motion. And now we see that we're dealing with actual people who are in process, not fixed sums or entities, not bricks and mortar, but people. And we notice if we add motion that Cheryl, who's the local pastor or conference president, apparently is closest to Jesus, but is in her general trajectory emotionally walking away from him. But you don't know that because she's in the position of the elite. Are you still with me? Now, you notice also that while the person who you thought was closest is really farthest emotionally, by the way, I'm just going to pause parenthetical statement. I mentioned this the other evening. I'll say it again now. It is entirely possible and extremely, extremely common for people to be intellectual believers and emotional atheists. I believe what I'm supposed to believe because I'm supposed to believe it. But I'm not head over heels in love with the Savior because in reality I've never encountered him. Though he's been trying to get my attention my whole life. So not only 
is Cheryl on her way out or away from Jesus. But look, the person that we thought was farthest out, I mean, this person from all appearances, and this was me, by the way, the evangelist that baptized my mother, we weren't raised in the church, in any church. It was all new to us. And my mom came home one day after attending six weeks of meetings. Who does that? Well, Adventists do. After six weeks of meetings every night, my mom came home after six weeks of meeting and she announced to all of us children, I am now a born-again Seventh-day Adventist Christian. And we jumped for the dictionary. We had no idea what she was talking about. What is that? What is a born-again Seventh-day Adventist Christian? That's too many words, Mom. And while we're trying to figure out and we're looking at her like, really? Like, what have you become? Is it a good thing or a bad thing? Explain. She said, oh, I'll explain. For starters, you'll never watch television again and you're all henceforth vegetarians. <laughs> Which registered in my mind as a teenager as absolute lunacy. And so my mom was baptized, brought that thing called Christianity, the Adventist version of it, into our home. The evangelist that baptized my mother, my mom then sent him after me. She said something like, sick him. And as the evangelist came after me and tried to convert me, he tried to use the same methodology that he used to convert my mom, quoting Bible verses. Well, my mom was from a different generation in which the Bible, even though she had never read it, meant something. It was on the shelf, I guess, in her home as she grew up, collecting dust, but it was supposedly the Word of God. So she had some kind of sense that it was something. The Bible's something. So if you quote to my mom some Bible verses, right, she's going to say, oh, I didn't know that was in the Bible. You quote Bible verses to me? I was like, what does that have to do with anything? Quote Shakespeare to me, why don't you? I don't care, because the Bible had no given authority for me. I didn't even know what it was. I had never heard of the book of Genesis. That's how completely secular my upbringing was. I was listening to the rock band Genesis, but I didn't know anything about the book of Genesis. I didn't know anything about the Ten Commandments, nothing, and he's quoting Bible verses to me. I'm like, so? so? And he thought I was just irreverent. Well, I wasn't irreverent. I was ignorant. So that evangelist went to the church where my mom was baptized, and he said, and they only told me this after I was baptized. <laughs> it's a good thing they told me after I was baptized. They said, hey, that evangelist that baptized your mom, he said, if I've ever met a lost soul, it's that Ty Gibson kid. Don't waste your time with him. I was X. I was X. I was Xavier, only my name was Ty. And in our illustration, we see that while the one who seems closest is actually on their way out, the one that we might judge as farthest is actually on his or her way in. The point is that you and I literally have no idea by any external measures where anybody is proximate to Jesus. We have no way of judging, and so we ought not to judge. Simon, in the story, is hiding from his guilt in his condemnation of others for their guilt. This is the most slick religious maneuver that you can ever engage in. And everybody in this room, including myself, we've all engaged in it. Well, Simon doesn't see himself precisely because he doesn't see this woman. Somehow in his mind, he has created this bifurcation. There's me, and I'm a Pharisee, and I'm a church member, and nobody at least knows what I've done. So I can keep my chin up and throw a party and be at the center of religious life. And nobody knows the difference. But then there's this woman oh my, and everybody knows how bad she is. So Simon is taking refuge from his own shame in the shame of somebody else. 
We do this all the time. We have set up a psychological, missional, evangelistic community edifice that is killing us as a denomination. Adventism worldwide is in the process of dying, especially in the West and even to those places around the world where you can point to tens of thousands of baptisms. All the numbers indicate that we have no idea what happens to them the moment the Americans or the Kiwis or the Aussies leave after their mission trip and go back to tell their glorious stories about all their baptisms that happened in a mere two weeks, we have no idea what happens to those people. We have no way of keeping track of them. And we are creating a situation in which worldwide Adventism is in decline and Christianity as a whole is in decline. This basic equation where we subconsciously position ourselves against the gospel by requiring that people believe the right things and behave the right way before they can belong to the thing that we call it, the in. I'm going to suggest to you, although it is extremely uncomfortable for anybody who is depending on their condemnation of others for their acceptance with God. Did anybody catch that? Anybody who is depending on their condemnation of others for their acceptance with God will find this to be very disconcerting. But the moment you break ranks with your paganism called Christianity and begin to live toward others the way God lives toward you, there's a freedom and our evangelistic mission would go vertical with success. And here's the transition from believe, behave, belong. Brene Brown, who is a researcher, professor of some branch of psychology, sociology, this girl is firing on all cylinders. She is thinking more clearly than most right now. And in an interview that I watched with her, she says to the interviewee, if you ask me the one thing that I know for sure after 200,000 pieces of data, do you hear what she's saying? She's a, the girl reads, apparently, 200,000 pieces of data. Did you actually read all of that? Well, yes, I did. And I'll tell you the one thing I know for sure, and it's this. I know that in the absence of love and belonging, there's always suffering. That's what I know for sure. Well, I'm going to suggest that what Jesus is doing is he's, he's actually receiving people to his table, to his fellowship. The table practice of Jesus is extremely broad-minded and large-hearted. He's hanging out with and eating with and spending time with the very people that need to belong, listen now, before they can even find it in themselves to believe. And if we want them to behave correctly before they can belong, they will pretend to behave with the rest of us until they finally can't bear it anymore and they fade. The gospel requires that we relate to everyone, as we talked about last night, in Christ. We operate on the assumption of all that can be true of a person as if it is true of the person. Love believes the best, believes all things, Paul will say to us. So, back to the story. I tell you her sins, this is Jesus talking to Simon now, and they are many. Yeah, yeah, Simon, you're right. She's a sinner. I do know what manner of woman she is. Her sins, and they are many, they've been forgiven. They've been forgiven. They have been forgiven. Past tense, done deal. They have been forgiven. So, as a result, she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows little love, Simon. Now, Jesus isn't saying that Simon is actually a little sinner and she, Mary, is a big sinner. Jesus is saying she knows she's a big sinner and you don't know that you are a big sinner. 
You are taking refuge from yourself in her guilt. So this is what I'm going to refer to as the power equation of the gospel. Here is the power equation of the gospel. Love begets love. It's the only way it works. There's not a shortcut. There's no way around this. This is the only way it works. This is the way Jesus relates. Ellen White says it this way in a single line. Only by love is love awakened. And on another occasion, love is the agent God uses to expel sin from the life. This is the power equation of the gospel. This is acceptance and love before you deserve it. So that you begin to see yourself differently through his eyes. To be simultaneously in the same moment, perfectly known and perfectly loved, is the essence of our healing. He carried with him the memory we read. Jesus left the Passover with his disciples, or left Simon's house and went to the Passover feast with his disciples. As he's walking along with the disciples, what's happening? Well, one of the things that's happening is that with every breath he takes, she's traveling with him. He's covered with this stuff, head to toe. He sits at table with the disciples for the Passover, and as he says, one of you will betray me, and the stab of the pain of that betrayal reaches deep into his heart, simultaneously he takes a breath, and he is reminded that Mary gets it. As he is led from the Passover by his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he falls to the cold ground, clutching at the earth as if to prevent himself from being separated further from the Father. Jesus, in agony, begins to pray on that cold ground. And a secondary liquid is mingled with the perfume she's doused his body with, and it is his blood as it comes out of his pores. Jesus, on that ground, with every breath he takes, as Peter's asleep, James is asleep, John is asleep, the book Desire of Ages says that Jesus longed for human sympathy in that moment. He was wishing that Peter would just wake up from his stupor, crawl across the cold ground, and just lay a hand on the Savior and say, I'm praying for you. Jesus would have been strengthened in that moment. But they were all asleep, and he was alone, except for he wasn't alone. Because with every breath he took, the memory trigger of Mary's love was pulled repeatedly in his memory. I love you, Jesus. I get it. I believe you. And when the mob comes and he's led away and Judas betrays him with a kiss and nails are driven through his hands and feet and he's lifted up on the cross and it's dropped into the hole that was prepared for it and every tendon of his body wrenches downward with agony as his heart and mind is flooded with a sense of the guilt of the whole world upon his psyche, with every labored breath he takes, Mary is with him when nobody else is. He's reminded, she gets it, she loves me, she understands. He breathes his last breath, and it is the aroma of the fragrant gift she bestowed upon him. They lay his body in the tomb, and after three days, he wakes up to life again. And I don't know about you, but if you've been dead for a while and then you wake up to life, what's the first thing you do? You breathe. And as he takes in his first inhalation, he breathes in the fragrance of her gift. He comes out of the tomb, and Peter isn't there, John isn't there, James isn't there, Thomas definitely isn't there, Simon's not there, he comes out of the tomb and there's Mary. She throws her arms around him. He says, don't hold me back because I have to ascend to my father, but I'll be coming back. But please go tell Peter and the rest of those knuckleheads 
that I am alive. And as Jesus ascends to the throne room of the universe, the Father and himself having been separated for 33 and a half years, he steps into the Father's presence. And Desire of Ages says that all the angels spontaneously bowed down and began to worship him. And he refused their worship. He told them to get up off their knees and their faces because he had one pressing question. Father, can those whom you have given me be with me here where I am? Was it successful, Father? Are they redeemed? Can they be here? Father, can Mary come? Can Peter be here? Can James? Father, even Simon, can he be here? And the father says, well done, good and faithful servant. Man, it was amazing. The devil knows that his complete system, the whole edifice of evil came crashing down around his ears. And yes, they can all be here. And as the throne room is filled with the fragrance of her gift, when Jesus has the assurance of your salvation and mine, All the angels bow to worship him again, and this time he receives their worship because he has the one thing that matters most to him, the assurance of your salvation and mine. And this line from Desire of Ages is astounding. At that point in the story, Ellen White says, he did not count even heaven itself a place to be desired while we were lost. You serve a Savior who would literally rather die forever than to live without you. Jesus doesn't want heaven without Mary and Peter and James and Simon and you and me. All of heaven is pervaded with that beautiful aroma. My prayer today is that it would pervade our hearts and that we would begin to understand that all of us, to a man, to a woman, every single one of us. We have been forgiven much. Let's love him much out of the abundance of that gift.